Bro, we're just, we're so, so grateful that you're here. Man, thank and, you for having us, bro. And just yesterday, man, just once again, just thank you for coming and pouring into our church. It thanks for, fun. thanks for having fun. Maybe just really quick, I think it's fun. Like, why don't you like, what, what was your experience? Like, what's your vantage point? You go to so many different places. Maybe like, because yeah. it helps us, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. everyone wants to think that they're doing something unique. Yeah. Like, what, what are some of the unique things that you kind of even see so, in this community? Um, the biggest thing that I love in, I knew your pastor, your leader, before I met all of you. And it's so cool that you guys actually duplicate DNA and then multiply it. Wow. Like, I I could know how your leader was by how I experienced Blue Church wow. yesterday. Wow. And that's, that's, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Because a lot of people, they do their own things, they have their own language. I know that Pastor Rich says, so good. Cause y'all say it's so good. <laughs> I know, I know, I know that you said beautiful, cause, cause I know, I know that because I can hear it and it doesn't seem like a robot. It, it seems authentic, but the DNA has translated. You guys celebrate all the time. You meet people with a smile. You're, you have such a heart to serve people, and not just the people. Oh, we had several people that were guests. And their experience, like I had um, an aunt that came, they were up for uh, a wedding from uh, Dallas Mm. and they came, her and her daughter, and what they were saying, and they weren't the guest speaker or anybody else, but their experience. So I think one of the cool things is the the culture of this place is strong and you need to guard that. Yeah, and you need to you need to pump more into it and you need to make sure that you're unified because there's a huge, huge impact that it leaves on people when you leave. So the culture is beautiful. And, and I think the other thing is it just seems fun. Yeah. I go a lot of places in churches a week. Like it is like it really it it is about it is only about the main thing. And it's getting you saved, even if we're mad doing it. And even if it's even if it's something that is you, you know, we know we're supposed to do, but we're not having fun doing it. You could sense the wow. joy of the Lord. Yeah. And that was strength for other people. Wow. Yeah. When the Bible says the joy of the Lord yeah. will be your strength, I think it's other people's strength too. Yeah. It's great. So like when you come into a joyful atmosphere, like that may be the thing to lift everybody else up. And so, I mean, I told Rich when, when I walked in, I said, man, y'all are building something next level here. And you guys don't need to take it for granted. It's sexy, it's cool, you're in Miami, you know it, it's boo, like who has a church name? Boo. Like all these, you know what I'm saying? All these other things, but please don't get it twisted. Like wow. when you cut this open, God is in this thing and he's trying to represent what he wants wow. for humanity through a place like this. And so don't take it for granted because 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 God could be doing a lot of things a lot of other places and he's sure. doing it here yeah. Yeah. so be encouraged man it's all awesome. beautiful um I think it's fun I'm maybe you've answered this question like a whole lot this past year but I I just find the story to be so encouraging and so like a God story and yeah. so I think as believers, we're, we like we need stories like this to hear that really really like build our faith but can you just maybe like break down just a little bit of like your, your story of getting on staff at Transformation, okay. what this last year has sort of looked like, and okay. just some of the timelines, some of the key moments. Just I think it's be helpful for everyone here. Okay, so um, realistically, this, this really has been the craziest 10 years of my life. Because, um, and I say that because a lot of people think it started last year, but anything that God does great has a long runway. Yeah. Beautiful. Like, so no plane gets up in the air in this much runway. Right. So I, I want you to I want you to know that we've had a long runway even though we didn't know we were on a runway. <laughs> so, so that's the beautiful thing. Like you think you're on a dirt road, like just doing riding a bike and it, it turns into the runway that's, that's gonna beautiful. be something huge. And so um me and my wife, uh, I married her in 2010. We've been high school sweethearts. Um, I met her when I was 15 years old and she was 14. And that was the greatest gift that God gave me in my life was meeting her. And um, when we transitioned, she was fully supportive because I'm a music producer by trade. Like that's the only job I've ever had other than pastor. I have my own production company. I was producing music for Universal and HBO and doing stuff like that. And so I was music, 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 played drums since I was two years old, traveled, been on tour, all those other things. So music. 
And so um, it's so crazy how God will mess up your plan to get you in purpose. And, and, and so we were, we were in route to moving to L.A. or New York. And my parents, they're people of prayer. And uh, my mom and dad, man, they're the most beautiful people. And I honor them because um, they will obey God. They, in 2008, they started a church. And I told them, this is the dumbest thing you could ever do. Like, <laughs> y'all are 50-something years old starting a church. Like, and you can't even start on Sunday mornings. You're going to have to do on Sunday night because they're full-time itinerant ministers. And so they were usually preaching somewhere on Sunday mornings and then would fly back so they could preach to their church on Sunday night. I was like, this is dumb. Don't do it. And um, I didn't go for eight months. But, but God knew the only way that I would get in ministry is if he put my parents in a position that they needed help. Mm. Yeah. So I didn't go for eight months and I was running sound at the church. It was called Greenwood Christian Center. I was running sound at this church when I wasn't out of town on tour. And um, so on Sunday nights, about eight months into my parents starting the church, Spirit and Truth Praise and Worship Center. Um, That's a good name. That was a, I mean, powerful anointed walk-in. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> hey. Just yes. the name alone. Just right there. Yeah, preach. Yeah, bro. Wait till you see the logo. Um, <laughs> I'm not playing. Um, so, so we literally, we, we, I felt like, man, it's my family. I got to at least help them with the music. So I started going to Sunday nights to help them with the music. Maybe four weeks after I started her helping them with the music, my mom comes to me in this deep prophetic kind of tone. And she's like, God told me. You're supposed to do something with the youth. I said, you have four other sons. <laughs> like, and, and you only have seven people in your church. Why would, you, why would I be doing anything with the youth? She said, God said, you're supposed to do something with the youth. Wow. And so about a month later, I said, okay, you want, you want four people in your church? We're going to do it. And I was just being sarcastic and just a brat, just, just because I didn't think anything of it. And so we started, um, and God told me four things before I walked into the room. And I had never studied. I had never preached a message. I had never been in front of anybody. He said four things. He said, I want you to be real. I want you to tell on yourself. I want you to love them first and don't judge them. Wow. Wow. That's it. So I walked into the room. It was seven people. Brenton was there. Jonathan was there. It was three of my brothers, his brother and sister. So that was six and one random person. <laughs> and, and we started on that first day and it was called So Fly. And they named it Sold Out Free Life Youth. So Fly, our mascot was a fly. That's good. It was great. <laughs> and um, for the next six and a half months, um, we just, I would go in there and I would be myself. I would use Bible stories that I learned it from like McGee and me and like, <laughs> I am not, I am straight. Like, expectations. Yeah, bro, like the Odyssey, like oh, I was like, I, like, I was just using things that, that stuff raised us, man. That, yeah, I was using things that were stuck in my heart. Yeah. And I was wow. just sharing with them, wow. like, there's a better life than just sleeping with people, smoking weed, and popping pills, like, yeah. and being funny about it, and all of that stuff. And within six months, 150 young people were coming. Wow. We All we had was a room. We had no sound system, no microphones, no video games, no nothing. And we just had a circle. And these young people, Brentum was one of the key catalysts. MySpace was out right then. And he started inviting people on MySpace from his high school. And they just started coming. Mind you, at the time, the church had 15 adults in it. Wow. 150 young people. Wow. And, and this is why I just, I give so much credit to my parents because they were faithful over what God called them to do, even though it was the incubator for something much wow. bigger. Wow. And, and a lot of us won't be faithful over the thing that looks less, but it's the thing that's keeping it going. Wow. And so, um, and so... I still thought it was a fluke. I still wasn't studying. I, it wasn't, it was just like this thing that was organically happened. One year goes by and the circle is around the room three times. And there's 250 young people coming and 20 adults in the church. And I'm just like, what is going on? In the same time period, the church that I was running sound at on Sunday mornings, 
um, the, the music director moved back home and the pastor came to me. He's like, I know you do music and stuff. Interim, could you please just take over the music? So I become the music leader at Greenwood Christian Center and I'm the youth leader, not pastor director because I didn't know none of those. The youth leader at, at Spirit and Truth Praise and Worship Center. And one of my only requirements at Greenwood Christian Center was to do Tuesday night rehearsal with the team and come to staff meeting. And I've never been in a staff meeting in my life. I've never worked for anybody, a real job. So this is just kind of like, okay, I'm in a staff meeting. I'm sitting in the very back, like ducked off in the cut, waiting for this to be over every meeting. And um, one day I'm sitting there listening and I was like, man, this pastor needs some solid leaders who don't want to be him, who can help him build this church. And then I would go to my parents and I'm like, man, they need some structure. Like they're doing three hour services on Sunday night. This is not gonna grow. Yeah. Like, and so one day I felt like I should just say it. And I said, man, y'all came here 30 years ago to help Carlton Pearson build higher dimensions. Do, do you think y'all could come together to do this together? And they were like, nah, that, that'll never work. And I was like, okay. Three months later, the spirit said, say it again. And I said it again, and they both were like, well, maybe. And they started talking to their oversight. Larry Stocksteel um, was Gary McIntosh's oversight, and the late Miles Monroe was my parents' oversight. And June 4th, 2011, the churches merged in a campaign called Better Together. And subsequently, I was setting my own trap, bro. Like, subsequently, I became the youth pastor. And the first day we did So Fly at Greenwood Christian Center, 500 young people changed. And that's when I was like, "Uh uh-oh. (laughs) <laughs> this may be for real and so I started studying we did we did three internships I raised a, a, a 12 person leadership team the church had just went through a financial crisis and so they couldn't give me a budget so I had no staff I had nobody else I had to raise everybody up we had to teach the young people how to give and um, and so we're just in that whole thing and the pastor comes to me and he was like hey we have two different cultures in our church we have this Sunday morning kind of Pentecostal like churchy church situation in the morning and then we have this vibrant like youth thing happening at night I feel like they're supposed to come together I said okay what do you want to do he said you're going to need some more authority to do that I said okay uh, what do you want to do he said I want to make you the executive pastor of the church I said what does that mean he said I don't know but we're going to figure it out (laughs) and he made me the executive pastor of the church I'm 26 at the time I've no ministry training, no nothing, but he saw something in me that was like, yeah, we can make this work. And so I just went to every conference I could ever go to and was like, yeah, we could do that and we could do that and we could do that. And I just start implementing like simple things like sermon series and like, like, let's make sure the people know what we're talking about and let's give up. Like it was not doing any of those things. So we were doing those things and I would be preaching on the weekend like once every two months. And I was still doing so fly. And then the pastor had a heart attack. And when the pastor had a heart attack, he survived the heart attack. But while he was gone, I was the only one that could cover. And so people ask me, did you go to seminary? Or did I say, yep. For eight months, I preached four different messages every week to four different crowds of people. So on Sunday morning, I preached to this older, traditional group of people. On Sunday night, these unsaved, horny youth. And then on... (laughs) On Wednesday night, I preached to the people who wanted to go deep in God. And then on Saturday, we had an internship, and I had to teach at that for eight months wow. every week. There you go. And it about killed me. Yeah. Rich. Like, I, because I, I, I didn't know how to study. I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know anything. I was just relying on the Holy Spirit and ripping everybody off. Like, that was, <laughs> that was my, that was my formula. Like, and, um, and, and so the pastor comes back and he's like, I need to get my strength up. And so he said, so um, I want you to do two weekends a month and I'll do two weekends a month. And I said, OK. And it ended up being more like I was doing three. He was doing one. And then this season came where there was no more vision coming. Like I'm the number yeah. two trying to like, what are we doing? Where are we going? H- how are we doing it? And there was no more vision coming. And I took that as a sign like, wow, my wilderness season is over. I'm, I can go to the promised land now in music. Like, this is easy. Like, I, I see what I can do over here. And so me and Natalie talked to him. It's like, yeah, this is the season where we're done with the church and I'm about to go make this money and pay for the church. Like, that's, that's yeah. my idea. And so I went in to tell the pastor and I said, hey, there's no more vision that I feel like I can facilitate in this season. I feel like we've gotten to a great place. And they said, there's no more vision because we don't feel like we have it for the next season. 
I was like, exactly. Um, so that's why. <laughs> and, and, then, and then Pastor Debbie, Bishop Gary's wife, said, no, we don't have it because we believe you do. Wow. And I said, oh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that, this wasn't a threat. Like, I wasn't coming. Because, Rich, honestly, I had never thought about being the pastor of a church. That never crossed my mind one time. I literally told them, I said, I can't be the pastor of this church. I don't like people that much. That was my exact words. Wow. And he said, no. He said, I've seen a lot of pastors, and I've, I've seen it happen in different ways. But then he began to chronicle for me how I've been doing the things a pastor would do. He said, I gave you no budget. And he said, you taught the hardest group of people how to give. And, and, and he said, you were able to hire two staff members off of what these young people were given. He said, they were given $8,500 a month from, the eight, from high school to the first two years of college. He said, you taught them with no manipulation how to get. He said, that's what you're going to have to do as a leader. Wow. He said, you raised up a 12-person leadership team who stayed faithful for three years with no money. You didn't pay them once. He said, that's what you're going to have to do. Wow. And just begin to chronicle yeah. for me, and I didn't even see it. And so me and Natalie begin to pray and talk about it. And it's like, maybe, maybe this is it. But the thing that got us is he said, I assure you, don't worry. It'll be five years from now. So he said, 2019 you would be the pastor of the church. So in my mind, I was like, okay, so now I kind of know where we're going. I can get ready. I can go back to school. I can make friends with Rich Wilkerson. Like I can, I can do some things so I can be prepared for this. And this was May, 2014, September, 2014. And a random Sunday, he gets up and says, and this is why next year, Pastor Mike will be your new lead pastor. Oh. I grabbed my wife's knee so hard on the front of that. And I said, did he tell you something he didn't tell me? And she was like, no. And we're just sitting there smiling. And, and, and I was like, I don't, I don't even know what's going on right now. And it wasn't even six months later that the tide began to change. Like when he said it, a leader rose up in me. Like I could feel it. Like I could feel like I'm supposed to change this. I'm supposed to do something. And so... Um, February 1st, 2015, three days into our 21 days of prayer and fasting in January 2015, the Holy Spirit told him, he said, if he's not the pastor February 1st, it's not going to be good. And he called me right out of prayer. and He said, we about to do this thing now. And I said, do what then? He said, you're about to be the pastor of Transformation Church. Wow. February 1st, 2015. And all I can say is there was a supernatural grace that came over me and Natalie's life when we were handed that baton. And um, it was so crazy because I was, he was a white pastor in his 60s that came to the hood to start a church because in 1921, there was one of the most horrible race riots that happened in Tulsa that they do not teach in schools that happened right there where the church is planted. And God told him to go there and reverse the curse. So one of the only at the time to, um, um, examples of a white pastor pioneering something and handing it to an African-American leader, next generation leader. And so this was like the culmination of reversing the curse in this, in this area. And when I stood there, it, it was an all black church pastored by a white pastor. And God told me, he said, you're not supposed to do it like this. He said, I want you to build a multi-church. And I said, okay, God. And he always tells me four things. Like, I don't know what this four thing is, but it's, it's right before I got up there, he said, I want you to say this the first day you become the pastor. He said, you're going to be a multi-ethnic church, a multi-generational church, a multi-campus church, and a multiplying church. And I want you to tell them on the first day that's what you're going to be. So I stood up there. We got a video of it. And I'm standing there shaking. I'm like, hello. <laughs> and I stand up there and I say it to everybody. And at the time, we were none of those things. Wow. And Rich, all I can tell you, man, is the grace of God has overshadowed every one of our deficiencies. Wow. Wow. And wow. if you walk in a transformation church right now in the hood of Tulsa, it's 60% white people. And I'm dressed in Jordans and ripped jeans and Yeezys and hoodies. And there's middle age, like, I mean, the whole Glee Club is at... <laughs> I am, I'm not playing. Our church looks like heaven. Come on. Come on. Like, 
every generation, awesome. grandmother, all the way to grandchildren, sitting on the same row, worshiping God together. Awesome. And so we we we've been able to see God do exponential things through the plan that He had set in motion, sure. and um, and that's how we kind of got to the transformation church side of it. Wow. Now the whole explosion thing, that's a whole nother story. So let's just hear a little bit of that story. Just, <laughs> just go into it. I like the way this interview is going, man. <laughs> it's story time with Mike Todd. Story it's good, time. Yeah. I, think okay. it's, I think it's inspiring. Well, I think the biggest thing is when God calls you to something, he'll never show you what it's going to be for. Wow. Wow. That's why you walk by faith yeah. and not by sight. And that's why you have to have a vision. And vision is what you see with your eyes closed. Sight is what you see with your eyes open. And too many people are living their life by sight, not by vision. So when I, when I took over Transformation Church, God told me not to look at what it is now, but look at what you see on the back of your eyelids. And so daily I would close my eyes and I would envision Transformation Church because the sight was depressing. Like what I saw was depressing. The first year I lost my entire staff, like the entire, all my friends, everybody that helped me build the youth ministry, everybody that was doing it, every one of them either had to be fired, let go, or had a different season in life. There was a time where I was standing there. I was the graphics designer. I was the music director. I was the pastor of the church. I was over all creative. I learned how to do video, everything. It was me and a business person. That's all Transformation Church was. One year into it. And God said, close your eyes and get the vision. Wow. Wow. And so that season was super hard because I always thought I could do it if, if I had a squad. Like, yeah. as long as I got a team, like, we can do it. And God was like, yeah, no team. I need you to know you were called to this besides anybody else. Wow, that's great. That's huge. So he took away all my props. All my, like, I didn't, I didn't, because I was good with things. Like, I could, I was overcompensating for my deficiencies with other things that could make it awesome. Wow. And so the music made it awesome. And God told me to stop paying all the musicians. So all my good musicians left. He said, I want to, to go back to the heart of worship. And these people are coming for money. And so I want you to pay them for two months and have them not play and do pastoral led Bible studies and create YouTube worship set lists and do that live on Sunday morning. And I visioned our church. Y'all, I was crazy, bro. I visioned our church into it, and we did a series called 20 Forever. It's actually the series that I'm in right now, yeah. but it was one of the first series that I did before we had cameras, before we had video. And I said, I'm going to teach you how to worship the king because we will have a culture of worship in this church. And I said, so it will not be about who's on the platform. It's going to be about us worshiping God. And I would cut up Carrie Job and Israel Houghton, and I would get YouTube clips, and I'd put it together with like a pad bed behind it because I'm a music producer so I could kind of figure out how to do it. And we would do 18 minute worship sets with nobody on the platform for two months. I love it. And, and so, and I led them every Tuesday in pastoral led Bible studies. And I said, everybody who wants to stay for the vision after this, let's do it. And all the good musicians left. Yeah. And, and God said, okay, close your eyes, see the vision. And it was like all this like foundational stuff that I, I didn't see it all coming together because I'm not that structured in my mind. I'm more of a creative, but but God will get you to whatever place you need to be if you listen to him. Wow. And so I'll say I'm not naturally that structured and all that other stuff, but if God's telling me something, yeah. he's a structured God. He's an That's organized great. God. And so we really just have to listen to him. That's great. And so I was just listening. And, and long story short, um, we come up into 2016 and we always gather around a word for the year. And God said, we're going to go beyond. Like, this is our year to go beyond. And the budget, I mean, when you transition a church, usually they tell you the first two to three years, the budget and the people are going to go down. And then if it's a good transition, it'll start going back up. God's so faithful. He sustained us at the same number of people and the same budget for two and a half years. So all the transition I have, there are about 500 people coming. Every Sunday, we had one service at 10 a.m., and the budget was $1.2 million, and it was like that for two and a half years, and then God said, go beyond, and so I started getting up there yelling beyond, wearing t-shirts that said beyond, getting songs that said beyond, just doing anything I could do to help people know, but I just know I heard God to do that, and that year, we grew 400 people, 
and the budget grew four hundred thousand dollars. Wow! And so, y'all, 2017 was the best year of my life. Like it was just like God, you're faithful. You haven't left us. Like you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And so we're coming into that. We get to August of 2017, and God speaks to me because I'm preparing for this next year. We're in beyond, so I'm thinking the next word is going to be explosion <laughs> or like, <laughs> like detonation, or you know what I'm saying? Like let's go, like. And um, and he said, stride, S-T-R-I-D-E. Wow. I'm like, I don't even, I've never used that word, like stride, like what is that? I had to literally look it up. And stride means to walk in long, decisive steps in an intentional direction. Wow. Wow. I was done with the first word, walk, because I'm a runner. You're right, right, right. Like, like, you give me this much, I'm going to rip a hole in it, like, and that's my nature. Anything I'm give, giving, I'm going to grow it and all this other stuff. And God said, strive. And so for three months, I just acted like God missed it. Like this wasn't the word he said. Like the team was asking me, what's our word? Because they got to print T-shirts for it and all this other stuff. And I was like, I don't know. Like it's, maybe it's something that God's doing. And God kept saying, strive. It all culminated December 5th, 2017. So we're coming up on almost a year anniversary. When wow. when we were in a Stratop, a strategic operation meeting, and we had somebody that was facilitating this tool on our church, and we talked about how much growth happened and what God did and how he expanded the budget. And Tim Ross is um, one of our oversight pastors at the church, and he's sitting in the meeting, and he just stands up in the middle of it, and he said, hey, guys, this is amazing what God has done, but this is not sustainable. We need to slow down. We need to strive. And it's the only time I've ever heard anybody else use the word. And the Holy Spirit said, I told you. Wow. Yes. And so we're in that meeting and I'm, I'm like, what the heck is going on? So that whole night we spend all night like, I'm like, how can we slow down right now? How can we start walking? And I mean, I'm intense. Like, and then we came and Tim Ross, if you know him, he has Bible for everything. You're right. like, like, I mean, he can go to the Bible for anything. And as we were dialoguing, we came to the conclusion that Jesus fulfilled every messianic prophecy ever spoken about him. Thousands of years of prophecies. He did it in three years and you never hear about him or the disciples running to their next appointment. Wow. That's great. They walked everywhere. And you never hear, and in haste, the disciples dipped because yeah. there was a miracle. But you never, you never hear that. Yeah. And they walked to Samaria. And they walked. And I mean, this is the king of the universe. And he could have at least had a horse or a carriage. And the only time we find him in the Bible on an animal, it's a donkey, a walking animal. Wow. It's beautiful. Bro, I have, like, the revelation I have around this is so crazy. And so I said, okay, God, we're going to strive. We're going to do less so you can do more. And this was the phrase he gave us. You need to find the pace of grace. Wow. Like, there is a pace that, that I will give grace for. Wow. And pace is not fast or slow. Pace is set. Wow. It's beautiful. So right now, if I say, everybody clap with me. Come on, everybody clap with me. Let's speed it up. Let's speed it up. So I set the pace and you followed it. That's great. What God wants us to do as church leaders is see what pace he's setting in beautiful. the season. It's beautiful. So there'll be some seasons where the pace is like this and you'll have grace for this pace. It's great. And everything you do outside of this pace, you're going to have to sustain. Wow. That's really good. See, it's the difference between striving and striving. Wow. When you strive, you use all your effort and energy to make it happen. When you strive, there's a grace for what God is asking you to it's do. Beautiful. And, and, and this culminates... Uh, am I okay? Just, you're doing okay. awesome. I love it. This culminates in a couple of different stories in the Bible. And I just feel led to share this because of how influential you are. When Jairus comes to Jesus and says, you know what? My daughter's dying. Can you come and heal her? Jesus says yes, but he starts walking. How do we know he starts walking? Because Jairus is frantic at this moment. It's like, bro, my daughter's dying. You can heal her. Let's go. Nobody goes to the emergency room um, um, slowly. You're doing that fast. So I can imagine Jairus being like, all right, Jesus, do you need help packing up? Do you, what, do you, what do you need? We got to go. 
And Jesus walks. How do we know he walks? Is because he was walking at such a pace that two things happened, that there was a crowd that was able to keep up with him. And two, that a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years could reach out and touch the hem of his garment. If he was running, she would have never been able to even touch him. So he was walking. And it's crazy because Jairus, in my mind, is probably out in front. Jesus in this crowd is, is here. And Jairus is probably turned around backpedaling like, hey, come on. And Jairus kind of represents Western culture right now. And even in the church, like we got to grind. We got to hustle. We got to make this happen. We got we to gotta make this. We got to do this. And God told me, you can't make my plan for you come to pass more than I want it to come to pass for you. It's great. Like, I knew this before you did. Yeah. Like, I, and so what ended up happening is Jesus doesn't just, just um, keep walking. He stops and he turns around and meets the need of this woman. And I imagine at this moment, Jairus is like, yeah. what the heck? Yes. Like, we're going to miss this opportunity. Yeah. 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 It's going to pass us by. Mm, it's like, crazy. we had a window of opportunity to kill this, to crush it, yeah. to make it happen. And we're going to miss it. But Jesus is not rushed because he's in the pace of grace. And you know the story. When he turns around from the woman, they come back and say, hey, your daughter's dead. Don't even bother the master. Long story short, Jesus is like, no, I'm still coming because I'm graced for this. (laughs) And he gets to the house. He heals the woman. Long story short, that because Jesus was in the pace of grace, because he wasn't running to the situation, And he was walking to it. He was able to heal two people's issues in one day because Jesus found the pace of grace. And and so God was just telling me, he said, Mike, there's a pace that I'll give you and I'll set that I'll do more when you do less. Because at the end of the day, I'll get the glory and you'll still have your health with your wife. Like, I'll still grow the church and people will still like you because you're not an a-hole. Like, because a lot of people get in this make it happen thing and then they lose who God created them to be, trying to build what he called them to build. And so this culminates at this moment. We we go in to start striding. I stand up and I tell my staff that next day, I said, guys, we're canceling Christmas. And we had a huge Christmas production. This is the second largest time where souls come into the kingdom. He was like, cancel Christmas. I want you to strive. And I was like, guys, I don't know what what we're doing, but we're going to have a regular service on on Christmas. No special flyers, no special music, no nothing. We're just going to do it. And I just feel like we need to strive. And all at the same time, my whole staff was like, (sighs) and I was like, okay. Let's see what God does. So we're twiddling our thumbs. December 10th, December 15th, (laughs) December 20th. Like, and I'm feeling anxious because I feel like as a pastor, I'm failing. Like, we're about to miss people. Our window is about to close. Like, what's happening? December 22nd, a girl that I do not know, does not go to our church, posted a 10-minute clip of me preaching on relationships on Twitter. Back in August, when God gave me the word strive at the beginning. And she posted it on Twitter and two million people saw it in 48 hours. Y'all, I can't make this stuff up. And literally since six months after I became the pastor of the church, we have been putting everything that we did on Sundays on YouTube. And so we had 1,800 um, YouTube subscribers and if three to four hundred people watched our sermon back on a week, we were literally high fiving in staff meeting because we we almost saw as many people that were in butts and seats on virtual church. And we were creating yeah. a win out of everything. And all I know is I have four thousand Instagram followers in December of this past year. And every day it was going up ten thousand people. Wow. So like fourteen thousand, twenty four thousand, thirty four thousand, like for a month. Every day, I'm like, what's going on? Because I wasn't even on Twitter. Chris Harvey, my man right here, he started a Twitter for me and just started putting quotes on it that I would say from Sunday. I didn't even know I had a Twitter. So this, <laughs> no, but this is, this is how, how I want you to see. It was almost as if God was like, I want you to, to do less. I wanted to know that this was in your heart because what I want to do with you, I want to know it's all for my glory. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, 
30 days, we went from 1,800 uh, YouTube subscribers to 180,000. And I mean, it just, since then, it's just been one thing after the other, after the other. I think, how many people are subscribed on YouTube right now? Yeah, almost 500. Almost 500,000 people in the past nine months. Wow. And, and so every Sunday, like, we post our sermon up on Monday at 12. And did it go up today? Yep. At 12? Okay. <laughs> you, got it, you just got to check. Um, he's in Miami right now. So I just want to make sure the team is covered. Yeah. Um, but it goes up at 12. And by Saturday at 12, 100,000 people have watched it. Wow. wow. And, and, and these are the things that you can't plan. You just can steward. Wow. It's great. And so for us, it's been a lot of people like, where did he come from? And then, and then people call and they're like, bro, who did you hire, bro? Who's your marketing? What's happening? We've been doing the same thing on Instagram and all this stuff for the past four years. Yeah. You can go back, like if anybody wants to do a case study, I've been doing the same thing. This is a story of being prepared for whenever God blesses you. Yes. Mm. It's beautiful. We've been consistent when I had 24 people liking my pictures of me wow. and Natalie. Like, I post a picture date night and 24 people would like it. And it was consistent and now 24,000 people will like it. Like, it's not, about, it's not about what we were doing, it was about God knowing we were ready to handle what he wanted to do. Yes. Yes. And so um, a couple of major engagements happened after that. I'll tell the funny story of, of how we first connected. Or, or you start telling, like, when you text Paul. And yeah, I don't know what you saw or something like that. I think I saw something in December or January of this young guy preaching. I thought what he was saying was really good. And I think I either went back to your church page or your page. And I'm big into aesthetic and big into design. I was like, oh, yeah, this is like... This is my kind of tribe of people. Who is this? And I, I'm like, Tulsa, I'm like, why do I not know of this church? And this is like really in line with the way that we would want this to be said. And there's all these nuance to things. So the only person I knew in Tulsa is Paul Darty. I'm yeah. like, Paul, who is this guy, Mike Todd? I was like, give me his number. I want to I want to reach out to him. And he's like, oh, I've known Mike for years. And he sent me your number. And then I think I stalled on sending you a text. I can't remember why I didn't. And then I think it was in January, me and Oliver and Nick were at Fellowship Church and C3. I look at C3 speaking, I look over, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, like this guy's here. And so then we connected. Yep. And I think months later, I even showed you my text with Paul, like trying to yeah. figure out. But then I invite, this is the best story ever. This is like, this is like, it's almost annoying to even say it aloud, cause, but it's like, it's fun, cause we're all family here. But like, Mike, man, can I, I really need you to come and preach Sunday after Easter. Uh, I would be honored to have you at VU. So I'm, I've got to be out that day. I think our church would love you. Just wanted to introduce you. He's like, oh, man, I would love to be at VU that Sunday. Unfortunately, I'm preaching for Stephen Furtick at an elevation that Sunday. <laughs> I was like, man, I should have sent that text back in December. <laughs> but, I mean, and God's honestly like... I but, find, but it's just I, indicative towards the season of life. That it's like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no worries, man. No worries, no worries. <laughs> no, yeah, no. Like, I would, I would probably go with that one, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, but it's crazy, like literally Natalie was sitting right next to me when I made that text. And I was like, Natalie, would you ever imagine that I would be saying no to Rich Wilkerson because I'm about to do Elevation Church? Mm. Did you ever think that God would use us in any way to be able to do that? And I'm sitting there like in awe, like, God, how did you do this? And all he said is, I never pick people who are qualified. Yeah. I always call people who are always qualified people who answer the call. That's, cool. That's it. That's who Paul was. Paul was killing Christians, had an encounter with Jesus, and he said yes to the call. And he went on to be one of the greatest apostles. And so, I mean, that's why people ask me, like, how does it feel? I'm humble. Yeah. Like, every place that I go, every stage that I'm on, it's authentic. It's real. I'm not trying to put on from anybody. I'm not trying, because I didn't get myself yeah. here. There was not one call, not one kiss up, not one, I don't, God has positioned me, and all I want to do is be ready to be used by Him. And so, um, we're here to serve the church, man. And you're doing um, we're just excited to be a part of it. I think it's I think it's a beautiful story, and I think it's one that we need to hear. I think as we talk through it, like you got to be able to, like, 
you got to be able to look at facts and celebrate things and also go, how does this apply to me and what do I learn? Like, I think it's really important. I, the reason why I say this is like a really unique time is because 500,000 followers on YouTube, like there's, there's TV networks with like staffs of thousands of people that can't get numbers like that. Now, does that mean one's better than the other? No, like you have to follow out your journey, but I think it's a pretty special thing that 500,000 people are connecting towards the words of what this man is saying week yeah. to week. Yeah. And rather than ever be a critic of that, we always, as a culture, want to be a celebrator of that. Yeah. You know, we're called to be fishers of men. We don't get to do the catching. We do the fishing. But it's always amazing when you go, yo, how are you catching stuff over there? Like, let's, let's, let's talk and you learn. What I love about Mike's story is Mike's not up here going, yo, like, I'm the man because of this. You actually hear that I've been doing the same thing when it didn't have the popularity, when it didn't have the connection points. And that's what we always have to learn in these yeah. moments. And so I want us to always be that both and kind of culture. Yeah. Wow, let's celebrate what God's doing somewhere. Let's learn from it. But let's hear the, the facts. The facts were that I'm stewarding the small moments. And I just always want us to be a, a church. And the reason why we're even talking to Mike this way today, because if we're not careful, we can look on and go, wow, it's awesome. And then compare what you feel like in your life is not awesome and feel less than yeah. when it's actually not the story. We're missing the story if that's what we're doing yeah. from our perspective. And I just want to continue to publicly say, like, I just think that there's so much more to come for you guys. Yeah. And I love your heart. I, I wanted you to come back in December because I think you have so much more to say and so much more to share. And I was texting him the other day. He had written me, which is, by the way, this is like the, everything he does is like textbook the right way to do things. Before he came to our church, he texted me going, hey, what could I be saying that would help you right now in this season of your church? Do you know many people come to preach and minister or share that don't ever ask that type of question? So it just already shows his heart. But what I said to him was like, bro, just share what is ever inside of you, what you're fired up about. This is what's going on in the season of our church. But just know, like, you're going to be coming for the next 30 years, so you don't have to say it all on, the, on one Sunday, you know? <laughs> and I don't say that to every guest, but I said to these guys, I think there's a whole lot that's in them that only through time can it all come out of you guys. And I think it would be, I know we, we got some time. I appreciate you Bro, going to the length. I, I love this. This, <laughs> I love is, this is my thing. You're the best. Maybe for a moment, just because like, sometimes it's easier outside of your own like world that's familiar with you and that you're leading. I don't have all say for me. Sometimes it's easier for me to be vulnerable and honest outside of the world that I'm trying to lead. Mm -hmm. But how, what, 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 where do you feel pressure right now? When you're preaching, are you preaching to the 500,000? Are you preaching to the few thousand? Like, like how, do you, how do you separate the two? Do, are you, is that, is there, there's always a presence of mind. Today's a, you're supposed to be going into a rest a little bit here now. I already asked you to break your rest to come over here, but hopefully that's in your pace. Um, <laughs> but, like, like, but you have to still think about even today, like, man, did the thing, did the content go up? What, what right now, a year from this whole experience, where is there new pressure? Where is there less pressure? Got you. Is that um, appropriate? Yeah, no, this is good. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, I'll start with who I'm preaching to. Um, we have a target audience. I have a target audience. His name is Stormy. Um, through a uh, straight out process, I'm preaching to the same person every Sunday. And I'm preaching to everybody that affects him, but he's my target. So Stormy, we identified this with our team, is a culturally relevant 28-year-old dad who's not married. He is obsessed with convenience. He wants a crew. He, um, he desires to uh, be in what is uh, cool in culture, and um, he's looking for peace, and um, he's concerned about image. That's what I'm preaching to every Sunday. Wow. So why I wear the clothes that I wear, why I talk about my wife, why I do certain different things, he's my target audience. And the thing that I found out is Apple markets to a 13 year old teenage girl <laughs> that is their target audience and think about me taking a wet uh, uh tennis ball that i put in paint and 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 then i throw it at a target if i hit my target i hit other people with the splatter mm -hmm. if the church would ever find their target mm -hmm. we would get everybody else with the splatter wow. mm. and so for us if i target stormy and i hit him every sunday his baby mama's gonna come to my church because she was like, he acted different. He, he loved me. And so I get her. 
<laughs> Stormy's mom is gonna come because she said, I've been I've been praying working with this, this boy, yeah. boy and praying for him for six years. Who's got him doing this? Stormy's crew is gonna come because they just do everything together anyway. St- Stormy's wow. boss, who he works for, is gonna see the change in his attitude. Who's a 60-year-old white gentleman that he works for for a car company? He's gonna come. So if I hit my target audience, it's great, it's beautiful, it's helpful. So for me, and everybody's target audience isn't the same, but we identified like Stormy and honestly, Stormy's my little brother, Raphael. Mm. It, that's his life. And so it has a deeper connection to wow. me because if I ever get my little brother fully on fire for wow. God, like we can fold the whole thing up and I'm good. And so if I'm that passionate about seeing other people's children, other people's brothers, other people. That's what, and so that's our target audience. So the reason people ask me, like, why do you put secular music behind your 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 clips? I can't focus. Like, this is not for you. Yeah. yeah. Like, I didn't put this clip up. You came to the church and you know the YouTube link. Go watch it there. There's no music behind it. But when I put this commercial up on my Instagram, I have a target. And if I play a Drake song yeah. underneath me talking about the grace of God. It may allow him to stay there for 30 more seconds to where I can grab his heart. And, and so it's not just like, oh, we're trying to be like the world. I'm trying to reach my target. Yeah, that's great. And, and so, and you know, I don't say those things publicly and we don't go back and forth on social media with people. But there's a method behind this. Yeah. Because if I get my target audience, everything changes. It's beautiful. And so um, there is pressure there to be able to. Make sure that I'm speaking to him in a culturally relevant way without compromising. Wow. Wow. And Jesus did this so beautifully. Like he could, he could literally, when he's standing with the woman who's being that was caught in the act of adultery, and he's able to stand with her and 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 not condone what she was doing, but but not lose his conviction. That's what I want to be. Like, I want to be the guy who can stand with whoever that everybody knows is like living the most backwards against God life, but then have the rapport enough to say, but yeah, go, but don't, don't do that no more. Yeah. Don't sin no more. That's not, that's not going to help you. Yeah. And so that's where a lot of the pressure comes from is because I got this churchy group over here and I got these unsaved people like, yeah. bro. The shade room. I don't know if y'all know what the shade room is. It's basically like the, how would you describe it? Like the, a gossip blog for all celebrity crap. Like, but it has almost 15 million followers. Yeah. They text me on Saturday and was like, hey, would you be willing to um, come on the shade room live next Sunday? and speak to all of our people for five minutes about Jesus or whatever you want to talk about. What? But somewhere along the way, I was able to get to somebody who doesn't even, I mean, it's trashy, it's raunchy stuff, but they feel like, but maybe he could speak to it and somebody, if they want to hear it, they'll be able to listen. And, And bro, we're a secret agent church. Bro, we pray and fast more than anything you could ever. Like, we're not out here just trying to be cool. We There is a deep well that we put in so that when we present, it is, it's more samurai. Like, it, like yeah. we going to cut you up and you don't even know that you had surgery. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, that, that's our thing. But that means we have to be so in tune with God. Our discernment has to be right on point. We can't get stuck in petty things. We got to go right to the issues that we have with each other because there's already division that we have to solve in the world. So we can't be divided with each other. Like, those are the things that we start. So pressures are just thinking. Like, I'm always thinking about those things. It takes me days to stop thinking about those things just because I know that God's given us a seat of influence and I want to steward over it. Yeah. So we really believe, you know, you teach what you know, you reproduce who you are. Yeah. So for you, there's a personal side of this whole thing that's like, man, your whole life now has been put into a spotlight like never before. Mm-hmm. But it's not just you and Natalie. Ooh. Your whole church has whole grown numerically on every side, every front. What where would you feel what, what's been what's been challenging with growth? I think we, I think everyone wants growth, but there's a challenge to yeah, growth. It's so growing pains. What are what are some of the growing pains that you face? You have never seen anything grow without pain. Wow. Everything will have growing pain, down to muscles. 
Like if you're working out, you will get sore. There'll be stretch marks. It will be growing pain. If you have a baby, you will have growing pain. And so I just think that we celebrate the growing so much that we never talk about the pain. Mm. Yeah. And and so the pains, the pains for us are, are like the leadership gap. Like we went from having 650 people in two services in one year to having 3,000 people in five. Jeez. Cause our space is not big enough to, and so you talk about like, like leaders, like we need people and it's like, boom, it happened like that. So, you know, we have time to build leaders and go through 12 weeks of classes and all this other stuff. And so that's been uh, a challenge for us. Another challenge is just knowing who you can trust. Yeah. Like, like we've been having to hold people like this because uh, I think it was um, Bishop Mike Jones that said, back then you didn't want me, <laughs> but now I'm hot. <laughs> You're all on. You know what I'm saying? You're all on. <laughs> like, like, but, um, That's good. but what, what, what ends up happening right there is that, that there is a fandom that comes with what God is doing. And so you don't know what people's motives are. Yeah. Are they, where were you at last year? Like when we needed some serve, now you want to serve yeah. the pastor? Like you've been, like, it's just all of those different things. So it takes a lot of discernment. Mm. And, and my wife is my discerner. Those eyes can see right through everybody. <laughs> and so I'd be like, oh yeah, that'd be great. And she's like, mm-mm. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, don't they said everything right and they did everything right? She said, no, 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 no. There's something there, and I have to trust that. And 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 God and and the few times I have it, and I was like, no, you need to, you need to listen to me. I'm the man of this house. I'm the pastor. It never works out well. It doesn't work out well. She comes back and she's like, I'm not gonna yeah. say it, but I told you so. <laughs> and. Um, and so those are the things. I think the other dynamic is just our family. We have five, we have three kids under the age of five. Wow. And so um, the dynamic and our middle son is special needs. And we're believing God for um, a miracle with him. And so um, it's just everything's growing. Everything's pooping on itself. Everything's screaming all at the same time. And this is the only thing I can rely on that I was graced for this pace. So that's why I don't take, that's like at the beginning of the year, and I've told you this, but I'll just share it publicly. Like at the beginning of January, when God told us to stride, he said, you only need to do two engagements a month. You only need to leave Tulsa twice. And I didn't know, I had four engagements all of 2017 combined. Not because that's what I wanted to do. That's all that people asked. Like, and from January to May, 650 speaking engagement engagement requests came in. So, so, so it was literally. What did you say? Yeah, my wife had something to do with that number as well. Yeah, right. My wife right, and yeah. the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit, yeah. for my wife. Um, but yeah, we had to find the pace, and so th- just listening, obeying that saved us. We could be in a horrible spot as a marriage. I'm here trying to provide for my family and, and, and make things happen. Girl, you, you know this is for our future. This is for our kids' college. Nope. God said a word, so if he called us to this pace, he's going to provide at this pace. Yeah. And so we've, we've had to say no to everything I used to pay to go to. And I think, I think the biggest thing for me, I mean, Rich, the biggest doors in the world where I know there's thousands of dollars on the other side of the yes. And other people, they may think it, but we're not balling. Like, we we are on the come up. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying? And I say that, <laughs> no, I say that to be transparent because a lot of people would think like, oh, they're doing it and they're, they're wearing off-white shoes and stuff. Those are gifts. Like, people are giving me those. Like, I want to be real because people think that it's something that it's not. And 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 for me, like, we're still on our come up. So, so me saying no to things is trusting God. Yeah. It's not just saying no because I got so much we can just yeah. we can say no to it. It's saying no and knowing that that was twenty thousand dollars I said no to. Yeah. Mm. That was possibly a connection and my no. This is the thing. My no has become anointed. Yeah. I have an anointed no, and that sounds deep, but anointed just means God's approval. Yeah. Yeah. So every time I say no, God says that's my boy, because. Because of that, no, I got something over here that's not going to take from you 
that's not going to do this because you can you can find out if it's God if he blesses and it adds no sorrow. Yeah. That, isn't that what the word says? The blessings of the Lord make rich and add no sorrow. Things that we are calling blessings a lot of times aren't because they add a lot of sorrow. Wow. And, and, and so God's really been good. trying to really build in me that when I do it, there's not a lot of sorrow attached to mm. it. And so that's been the, the, the pace that we've been graced for. And Rich, when I tell you that minus the regular life stuff, we are still just as normal as we were a year and a half Thanks ago. God. Yeah. Because, and most people can't figure out how this level of pressure hasn't done something, but it's been because we really found it's the beautiful. pace of grace. Man. Jensen used to preach this message about Moses and his staff. This powerful illustration he used to say, you know, you throw the staff on the ground and it turns into a snake. It's like real supernatural. He's like, a lot of people, they go from a staff to a snake. But the question really is, can you go back from being a snake back to just being a staff? Wow. And I think there's a, there's a challenge in leadership and there's a challenge in all of us when God uses us in a supernatural way. Yeah. Can you still go back to being natural after he used in a supernatural yes, sir. way? Some people, when God uses them, it destroys them because they don't know how to go back to creating boundaries and guidelines of going, you know what? All along, I was just a stick. Yeah. yeah. Nothing more than that. God decided to use this. Come on, man. And that happens on a small scale, big scale, scales like this. And so it's a lesson that we all need to learn. And I think, I think you're doing a great job with it. Man, and you've got, you, you got cheerleaders over here in Miami. Yeah. We, we actually do have like work we have to go through today. And most of us would love to sit here and talk all day with you. I do have one little maybe just final thought. We can take 10 minutes or so. I'm obsessed right now uh, in my private time and in discussions of thinking about what does the church look like in the next 15 years? And I think it's silly for us not to get some of your wisdom as to what you see for the church. And I'm not saying for 50 years, but even just like, I, I think in a lot of ways that you are blazing a path and creating some new models. And models are trends. Yeah. They come and go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Instagram right now is a tool that we're using. Yeah, I think it's awesome. You, it'll be different. But I think that you are leveraged those in a really beautiful way and you've utilized the tools. What are some things maybe you're seeing or thinking about or maybe in your private time? You got some. You guys are on the creative team there. What are you guys talking about? What do you see, where do you see the church going? What does it look like? Or what, what's what? Are, where are we missing it right now? Like you know, I think the biggest thing, and I'm no expert or nothing like that, but I do. My goal is to represent God, and, and I told that's why I wear it on my clothes and my jackets and everything like that. It's three things. It's to represent God, which is show God differently. <clears throat> It's to represent God. That means to gift God differently. Some of my best gifts are things that somebody once had that they loved that then they gave to me. They re-gifted it. Mm. And that's what salvation should be for all of us. We should represent it and give it to somebody mm, that's else. That's great. I love that. And then we represent God. And that's promoted differently. I have to make a confession. I am a private um, um, closet Dallas Cowboys fan. And they always let us down every year, every year. But they won yesterday. And... And what ends up happening with that whole thing is that I see grown men in snow that own law firms go to a stadium, pay hundreds of dollars for tickets, take off their shirt, paint a star on their belly and scream for a team that's going to lose. But they promote what they believe in. And there's been this thing in the church where we do not promote not somebody who may or may not win a victory for us, yeah. but the one who has won the eternal victory yeah. for us, and we won't promote it. And so that's what I'm called to do. And it's for lost and found people. And, and lost people are God's passion and found people are God's people. Yeah. And so a lot of churches pick one or the other, but I believe it's both of them, but it's for one reason, transformation in Christ. And that's our vision as a church, but that's my personal vision. And so I think... That's kind of where the whole church has to come to. That's where I see unity being a huge factor in this next mode of ministry. Is that the more we can do together, the more the world will see what Jesus has really done. The church is probably the most divisive place in humanity today because it's territorial, like it's your kingdom and my kingdom. But there's only one kingdom. Yeah. And all of us have different parts to play in this kingdom. Yeah. And if I'm trying to build my retirement fund with Transformation Church and you're trying to build this nest egg over here, we will not collaborate. But if we trust God to build his yeah, church, that's good. like 
Like I told Nick, I was like, I'll come four times a year. Like just put me on every quarter and I'll pre, I want to help build what God's doing here. Yeah. Like, and most people I post, we have, I told them this the other day, we have these cards since I started the church called not your cup of tea cards. And, and we great. literally this is good. at, 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 um, at all of the entrances and in our welcome, we tell people, Hey, transformation church may not be your cup of tea. I'm going to be loud. I'm going to make jokes. The music is going to be rocking and you may not grow in this atmosphere. What we have done is we have found about 15 other churches in the area, and we suggest that these are some churches you can go check out so that you can grow. It's great. Once every few months on Saturday, when every pastor in the world posts, come to my church tomorrow, I post, hey, we would love for you to come to TC, but here's some other amazing churches who have prayed for you, prepared for you, and I post pictures of the pastor, I post pictures of their location, I put their Instagram, I, I go and take the time to be their PR agent and push them, because until we become a kingdom organization, it's great. this is all competition in the name of Jesus. That's great. <laughs> And I think that he's not blessing that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I so, agree. And so what you what you have, what you get is what you have. And I just believe God can do so much more, man, if we if we build together. It's beautiful. It's beautiful.